Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Abbevam Rosellase, uh, director of the IMF's African Department, and welcome to Africa Perspectives. During these events, we discuss uh, issues that are very important uh, in the economic policy domain uh, in Africa, uh, issues policymakers are interested in, the general public are interested in. And I have the great honor today of welcoming Stefan Durkon, professor of economic policy at Oxford University, uh, to discuss his new book, Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose. As uh, the book's title lays out, um, Stefan has been thinking quite a bit about why it is that certain countries are developing fairly rapidly and others uh, not as rapidly. Um, and, uh, you know, outlines his thesis, which we'll go into in a, bit, in a bit. Just to say a word about Stefan. Um, he is Professor of Economics at Oxford, uh, as I said, uh, the Economics Department, also Director of the Center for the Study of uh, African Economies. But what makes Stefan great is that not only is he a brilliant academic, but also uh, has been in the policy realm for quite a bit. Uh, between 2011 and 20, 2017, he was chief economist uh, of the UK's Department of International Development. Between 2020 and 22, uh, he was development policy advisor to successive uh, foreign secretaries at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, he thus combines this brilliant academic career with the policy making realm, and uh, that makes it for a salient uh, conversation today, I hope. Okay, Stefan, again, welcome to the IMF. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So, uh, Stefan, jumping uh, straight into your book, huh? uh, you basically are, you know, putting forward uh, the, the idea that uh, some countries are poor, but while well, others grow, because uh, in the countries that are growing rapidly, uh, there is an elite bargain um, where some section of the elite uh, agree that it's better to gamble um, and you know aim for development. Uh, if you could say a little bit about you know what prompts the elite to gamble uh, for development, and what, who do you mean by the elites, and what do you mean by gambling? So. Um the key idea here is really that, first of all, in the country, we often make the mistake looking at just the prime minister or central bank governor, or minister of finance, or president, or something as the as the only people who drive anything in a country. So I like to emphasize, first of all, it's important to understand what the elite, which is a broad group of people, will be in politics, maybe in the military, definitely senior civil servants, definitely in business as well, possibly civil society, public intellectuals, you know, what they, they try to achieve with their country. And in fact, looking at a, at a kind of underlying implicit bargain that they have amongst each other is actually quite helpful to, to think about it. You know, you could, for example, have situations where a state fundamentally is clientelist, where it's all, everything is about can I gain power and control of the state to create jobs for the, for the boys, so to speak, for those who support you and whatever, could be actually could be quite kleptocratic. It could be in all kinds of, of ways that, that an elite bargain could be about where do we want to go with the, with the country. Now, when we look around the world of countries that have grown and developed, Actually, they may have done very different things in practice and some of the details of policy making. Of course, they do reasonably sensible policies, but it's probably a broader group. What this elite uh, seems to be underlying committed to is to be wanting to be judged by the progress in growth and in development. So I make this a kind of a precondition for, for actually being able to successfully develop is the underlying commitment of those people that have power and influence in the countries to actually try to achieve that. Um, and that's, I think, the, the essence bit. Of course, it still means sensible things need to happen underneath mm -hmm. it, but without that, we're just not going to get anywhere. Okay, so to explain to myself as much as the audience, what I'm getting from you is that, you know, before policies can be considered and which policies are appropriate, and there's a broad gamut of policies that work, you have to think, step back and think about the politics of how those policies can, you know, how space can be made for those policies. You know, how do you address the, the criticism that, you know, this has always been the case? You know, politics has always mattered more than uh, economics. 
Well, you know, I, I actually think to understand politics, you have to understand the economics of the politics. And in fact, a lot of politics is always driven by trying to think about who should have access to resources, who should control them. So the economic part is always part of it. I don't think we can separate politics from economics. So it's also not trying to say, oh, it's just only look at politics. You better understand the incentives that are being set in the economy as well. So first of all, but it's an interesting thing that you say it's always been like this. I think we just take it too much for granted. When we look at successful countries and think of some of the richer economies in the world, you know, we're talking here from Washington, we can look at London and whatever, we can see in history, also amongst the elite there, a shift towards not just doing distributive politics, who grabs what and then just fighting over, over the pie, but actually a shift towards we value it, we find it important that these economies grow and develop. So it may always have been like this, but I think often when we think in terms of our design of actual policies, we, forgot, we forget that the incentives have to be in place in your society to actually make them work and make them uh, and, and get them implemented and so on. So, so I, I find increasingly with my two lives, both as an academic economist, and I'm working the policy space, the only way I can make sense of it is to actually say, look, they are so closely linked that you have to be willing to consider them together when we're thinking about economic policy. And just think of the world, it is about economics From and policy. the policy side, which is political. Absolutely. So uh, one more question before we delve a little bit uh, more about the specifics of the book. on um, on the context in which you wrote the book. Of course, you have a lot of country examples and the learning that you took from, you know, what prompted you to write this book, I feel perhaps is a particular time in history, huh? a period when um, the global environment for growth was very, very uh, ideal. You know, global growth was fairly strong with China's emergence on the global scene, commodity prices for a chunk of this period quite high development assistance quite significant. So we had in a way kind of, you know, um, non-competing of ideologies yeah. in this last 25, 30 years. But it seems like the moment is turning uh, now and that more supportive external environment may not be there for particularly the poorest countries um, in the world. So how much is your book um, uh, a feature of the, the you know, the environment that we've had over the last couple of decades? So, so that's, that's an excellent question and actually a really fair one. And of course I was writing the book when the environment hadn't shifted that much yet to the kind of present day uh, challenge of geopolitics and post COVID as well. But when, I, when you look back at when some of these countries took opportunities and including some of them uh, I describe and we're thinking some of the Asian countries, when did they take opportunities? The situation was not necessarily benign either in many of these places. When Indonesia was trying to begin to do its, its path of, of sustained growth in the 1970s, early 80s, this was not a benign global environment to start with. Similarly, there were maybe certain benign factors, uh, uh, maybe that on, in terms of trade that gave East Asia an opportunity that we don't have today. But I think what is striking that throughout the last five, six decades, there were countries that, despite the challenges, found a way of taking opportunities. Now, I totally agree with you, the period, say, around 2000 to maybe 2015, 16, was a particularly benign period, and at least in the first, well, a big part of it with the super cycling commodity prices. And maybe it helps to explain why, relatively speaking, more countries took advantage than actually, and that's a little bit of the surprise, you know, it's actually been a remarkably period of progress. And we also got a couple of African countries that started to take advantage. But that point that certain countries began to take advantage in this period is really the important thing. It's always about, you know, opportunities are constrained. It's probably maybe a bit more difficult now, but there will be chances. I'm always reminded um, from the, the lines in, I think it was in, well, in, in Asian drama, Gunnar Myrdal, who always, uh, well, you know, he's unfortunately famous for the, for, the, for, the ex, for the predictions that he made on Indonesia in 1968 that it would fail, where we think in the 1970s it started to take off. And similarly, of course, Mauritius, which is also totally wrote off. And that's actually the kind of thing, you know, it's about taking opportunities. In the book, I talk a lot about Bangladesh. 
And I find Bangladesh a fascinating place because, you know, it was written off by the late 1970s. When I was a very young, you know, my first essay in development economics was about Bangladesh. And the title was the Henry Kissinger quote, Bangladesh is a basket case. And I um, emphatically said, I'm totally agreeing with him. This will not go anywhere in my essay. And then actually in the 1980s and early 90s, he took the opportunities. And it's, of course, still a bit of a messy place and all kinds of things. But that's what I kind of allude to. Maybe the, the opportunities are always constrained. It is actually a matter of uh, some countries taking advantage. And it's maybe another part of it, finally, for African countries. China growth rates, Singapore growth rates, mm -hmm. they are an illusion for anywhere else in the world. There's, these are just exceptional, very particular circumstances that came together. I'm talking here about success as a couple of percentage points per capita growth that goes up to a slightly different level, not hovering there at 1% or 1.5% on average over 20 years, but going to 3 4% per capita. That would be amazing success. And that's what I'm kind of alluding to as well. I think these chances will still be there. I can't easily predict them, but they will be there. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wonder if our sense of development, our thinking about development is somewhat distorted because we always focus on per capita income growth. Yep. Uh, I say this because I mean, and I'm not the first point to, person to make this, but you know, people like Charles Kenny have written about you know, how much uh, development indicators have improved tremendously, the things that really matter for, for the well-being of people, right, I mean, life expectancy, and that's an across-the-board phenomenon. So when you're picking up a few countries that have had high income growth, uh, are you not painting a picture where, you know, we, that we're not quite uh, acknowledging the tremendous development progress that has been made by a much broader swathe of countries? Yes. Look, I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the, the, the question. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it also shows something that being at the IMF, I'm asked the question, why do I focus too much on growth? And I think I'm really grateful for that, for that point. Um, in the book, Actually, my first and foremost focus is on extreme poverty. And I want to judge in the first and foremost based on extreme poverty. You could still say, well, the Charles Kenny point on the health and so on, I'm not capturing that well. But even yesterday, I was just looking at, uh, at the statistics. There is no country in the world, and uh, well, there's one exception, I'll just mention it in a moment, but there's no country in the world that has extreme poverty um, that is above 10% uh, and still has uh, child mortality, uh, no, I think it's infant mortality of, uh, uh, I think the number is 2% uh, uh, of children that survive past the age of, 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 uh, of one. And, and it's so, actually, these things still correlate strongly together. Honduras is a little bit better and extreme poverty is 14%. Uh, and so, you know, these things in the end, in a sustainable way, because I don't think there is any country in the world that in a sustainable way can really go beyond some of the most basic uh, indicators of extreme poverty beyond income without actually getting sustained growth. And so, you know, I don't think the debate is as, as clear cut, but it's important by focusing on extreme poverty, we try to discount growth that is entirely driven by, for example, natural resources and then only distributed amongst uh, the richer parts of the mm -hmm. population. That's not what I'm talking about. When I want to talk about uh, per capita growth, it's at least some process that tries and it's always very hard to discount the kind of extreme growth rates that occasionally countries can have from purely natural resources without investing it in their economy. Thanks. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll begin unpacking a little bit more uh, the book. Okay. So uh, first question I have is like, you know, um, how do you recognize uh, a development bargain is in the works? So, 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 the, so obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky question. And um, because the important part of a development bargain by emphasizing politics and the political deals that are made, not just by prime ministers or opposition leaders, but across key interest groups in business and in society, it means agency comes, becomes central. So it is not as simple as, for example, a whole agenda in institutional economics that somewhere in the 17th century I can find an indicator that can de determine whether I'm actually having high growth or low growth. So it's not just simply the kind of structural factors. Of course, they matter, 
but agency matters as well here in the way to think about it. And in my way of thinking, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of not alone. I mean, it's like Leonard von Chacon, the uh, economic historian at Princeton from, uh, from Benin, he, uh, he, he kind of nicely said, you know, it's probably about 50% structures and 50% agency. Now, I want to focus on that agency. That's where the choices are. Now, it does mean I have to look at actions and behaviors because it can't just be intent or past in indicators. So it becomes quite context specific that you have to learn to actually look at the country. Are the forces beginning to be aligned to actually make progress or are we just stuck and anything that is being set about development plans is just words and not actions. Now, at the same time, just as our friends nearby here feel it's okay for a senior economist in an office once in a while to tick a few boxes on a CPIA, an indicator of whether they actually governed or reasonably okay. I think we're probably coming into that realm, but not in a kind of a fixed list. When I go to a country, which I, let's call a country that I'm actually worried about where it's going, it's been for a long time relatively stagnant, say Malawi, I can probably identify 10 things that would give me a sign that somehow the underlying elite bargain is beginning to shift. You would look at that list as well. You may give also 10. I'm pretty sure when we do it with a group, about five of them would probably be the same. Yeah. And so you begin to think about is that how do you recognize it is that they start addressing not just the low hanging fruits, you know, the Charles Kenny, Charles Kenny type of things, you can do this. It's great that we do them, but actually find somewhere in the middle there, not that's impossible politically and or there is a revolution or a coup, but somewhere in the middle and say, look, this is where your space of action is, but you give me a sign that you're making some progress by actually beginning to address these. And for example, in Malawi, let me call it out, I would definitely have reforming the agricultural marketing parastatals would be an obvious thing to do. And you can't keep on delaying, seriously thinking about some of these things if you want, say, agricultural growth to actually take place. So, you, so that's what I'm kind of alluding to. It's context specific, but we can have a list and it becomes part of more deeply understanding rather than do you do this policy, but actually are you generally beginning to address some of the things that fundamentally make your elite bargain just distributive or maybe even kleptocratic or clientelist to actually something that's a bit better that actually begins to give the forces of growth and development a chance. And you call it a gamble. Huh? I mean, uh, that's the decision, for example, to, to unwind the agriculture agency in, in Malawi, you would consider it a gamble. Why do you use that specific phrase? And what is it that uh, you, you, I mean, what, what, how is it a gamble? Right. Now, OK, so since, since I mentioned Malawi, and I don't want to overstate the example, but, but there are, you know, in, in many economies in Africa, particular, um, particular things that need to be done that actually are likely address vested interest. And as a result, may create some instabilities in the elite backing. Or put it more generally, the easiest things for an elite is the status quo, because they know it, they know exactly how it works, they know exactly how to distribute the rents from, from the economy, they know exactly how to distribute the jobs. It's a bit of a bargaining, but it's easy. Growth in all the countries that we've observed it is quite a gamble. You know, if you go back to Deng Xiaoping in China, you know, that was a real gamble in 79 to actually dump ideology to some extent and actually becoming pragmatic in your economic policy making. That was a whole internal battle that within the party could have backfired. So the gamble is really moving away from the status quo creates and leashes new entrants in the elite, new powerful groups and so on that you need to manage. And we know historically growth can destabilize societies as well in terms of the political elite and it becomes an, a real issue of keeping it all together and keeping growth spurts to continue to go whether it's in recent times but also historically across the world and so that's actually why it's a gamble the status quo is the, the power of the elite is the status quo the power of the elite is to block progress and just keep it as it is there's no clearer place where this would be the case is countries with a lot of natural resources. Politics of the status quo is very easy there. It's all about distributing the rents from that and just keeping control of these rents. 
shifting the relative incentives away from purely the natural resources into a more productive economy will definitely change the, power, the balance of powers in these places. And it may actually also help to understand a bit why the political economy of reform in these places tends to be so much harder. That's a very interesting point. I mean, first, I, I want to unpack that and then compare natural resource development trajectories with uh, you know, countries with more diversified economic uh, structures. So just on natural resource, uh, can you think of an example uh, or give me an example of um, a country in a natural, you know, natural oil resource producing country where a development, bar where a bargain has been possible to move the country to a different equilibrium? Yeah. So, look, the, the, the classic example we would refer to in, of course, in Africa would be Botswana, where, where we not necessarily call it uh, a, a successful economy in totally shifting the, the, the incentives to an alternative sector, but where the underlying bargain related to natural resources has been quite developmental. A stable society generally, massive progress in, in, in development indicators. So there is, there is something there. So the kind of a minimal amount is here that we may well have observed historically with Botswana, now an upper middle income country, uh, from, an, from I think it was GDP per capita in constant 2015 price, it was about three, 400 in, in, in 1960. Of course, natural resources paid for that but actually it could evolve quite, quite, quite that. So it is, it is, is possible. Now, um, so, so that, that would be the, the kind of example, but it needed a particular political bargain as well. It needed, yes, clearly people willing to take some risks in the way the politics were structured and so on. But of course, in principle, um, they managed to de-risk <laughs> their, 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 their bargain in a smart sort of way uh, using natural resources. For kind of commodities, uh, oil, where the fluctuation in the price are much harder, of course this will be already much harder. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes an issue, can you do this at a time when, uh, at the early stages uh, of discovery and the beginning of doing it, that's the moment you clearly need to do this, or indeed when the prices are really high, that is your moment to actually do, do this. Now I find it really interesting, and I don't want to overstate this, but countries that in more recent times discovered their natural resources and brought them online seem to already have a slightly better deal. Not everywhere, and we can all think of examples where it's not, but where it actually is slightly better handled, where there's the chance early on to not lock yourself into that kind of equilibrium of distribution of, of rents from oil or from gold or whatever, and actually moving forward. I, I find it interesting and I want uh, next autumn dig a bit deeper into it, Tanzania, that actually gold has become a clear uh, one of the key export items and it's growing quite dramatically, but it has managed to keep its macroeconomy more or less stable. It's doing reasonable things now in the current government also on the economy and say, look, there is something there that I'm having a bit more confidence about than maybe uh, what's been happening in a few other examples that we worry about where historically the underlying deal around natural resources wasn't handled well. So uh, this reminds me a little bit of uh, Paul Collier's uh, argument that you have these threshold effects almost, right? I mean, where institutional quality, once it reaches a certain level, uh, facilitates. But doesn't this kind of undermine a little bit the broader point you make about elite bargaining that, you know, and lean a little bit more to institutions, structures, as you said earlier? Sure. But, but the, the point is still that like countries like Botswana, at the time that they did it, their institutions also were pretty weak and they were just like many other countries decolonized and they were not particularly strong institutions either. You need to be able to start this without, you can't wait for the institutions. I can't go around to DRC or to Nigeria and tell, you, tell, tell us advice please get yourself a better history and everything will be fine. I can't do that. That's not sensible advice. Of course, the institutions matter. The history of Nigeria and the history of DRC matter why it can be quite difficult to move away from it. But there is still some agency. And so, so there is a gradation. Yes, there will be certain places where the, the institutions, the, the structures constrain you more. 
But I'm a strong believer that still the agency is there. And in fact, if you look around the world, you know, Indonesia had natural resources, uh, and beginning of natural resources in the early 1970s. And it is an example of how much more sensibly run it. Actually, natural resources were quite important in that economy around 1970. And very quickly, they became relatively unimportant. And so that's also a bit like we shouldn't forget these bits of that kind of history. It's at these moments you can handle it. Maybe the problem is, so there is the Paul Collier point, definitely, that is to be made. But the, it, it, again, we have to be careful to say, you know, you can't condemn the places where the institutions are weak. And I don't think that's, that's a good view of history. You know, you're doomed forever in that institutional quality. The issue where it comes in a bit is that um, building institutions, um, sorry, building up, building up growth, you know, the extent to which natural resources matter is, uh, is, is probably quite important. If they are as big as in some Middle Eastern countries, you can do actually quite a lot, and distributive politics can actually get you to relatively high GDPs per capita and a relatively speaking a bit better living standards. When you have very little, it doesn't dominate. I think the problem in quite a few of the countries we're dealing with is that the oil is actually, or the natural resources, is not that big. You know, it's like medium oil. Uh, Nigeria, if we were to distribute it amongst everybody in society, we would have about $500 per capita rents. That's not a rich country. And of course, then you create incentives that controlling it with fewer people creates the incentives to actually get a sizable piece of the pie. So you get somehow these incentives there. But um, the, yeah, but, but the, the, again, we can't wait for the, week, for the institutions to emerge and then see it, and there is agency to begin to do it better. I, I agree. We certainly can, you know, cannot wait for the institutions um, to emerge. Um, so just go going back, uh, as I said earlier, to comparing um, elite bargaining or development progress between uh, highly natural resource dependent countries versus others, I have a little bit of a sense, you know, you say, earlier that um, it's perhaps more difficult to control resources uh, in, uh, in natural resource exporting countries like Nigeria versus more diversified exporters. But uh, isn't it really easier to know how to split uh, the rents in a country where you know, the money actually can be funneled into government uh, than it is in a more diversified economy where where um, resources are more dispersed. So, so, but this is actually where the, the emphasis on, on the kind of underlying elite bargain is actually quite, quite helpful. Um, so if we have an awful lot of natural resources, let me, just for the sake of argument, pursue the, the, the Nigeria case. Um, you know, rents are not that high per capita, mm -hmm. but if we can get a political system uh, for the sake of argument, that actually is only rather than 200 million people control the rents, maybe it's distributed among 200,000 people. Suddenly it becomes a really sizable thing. So that talks to your point. So it's easy to control the distribution of the rents. Yeah? So in a, in a country with a lot of natural resources, it's quite easy to control the distribution of the rents. But of course it means the incentives of the status quo are so much stronger. Because actually it's extremely clear that the interest of, 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 uh, of controlling groups in the elite will center around the kind of the, the oil rents and then the recycling of it in a non-tradable economy and so on. That's, 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 that's a controlled s a system of an economy that, that can emerge. When you have it more diversified, actually new elites keep on springing up. But actually what they have in common is actually an interest that, uh, that actually growth should be able to take place because a new sector may emerge but they want to actually grow. And so actually it makes it easier not to go for the status quo, but actually even if I'm the political elite in control, I need to keep on having all these sources of, 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 of economic activity to grow. So I can't just funnel all my attention to one. I need to allow a more diversified economy to actually flourish. 
And then actually I'll come quite quickly to have incentives for more sensible growth policies that are not selective, but actually that are more general, that the incentives are set generally for growth rather than for a specific small sector that I need to keep on, keep on controlling. So I think the incentives for the status quo are much weaker in a more diversified economy. And actually think, you know, I'm a leader in a country. I mean, actually think of it in, an, in, in say, some East African economies that are a bit more diversified. You know, I still need rents from my politics. My politics is not cheap in most of these countries. So I need to actually make sure there's growth taking place. I can't just simply directly put the oil rent in my election fund and then win it. No, I need to actually get growth being created. I need to find a way, hopefully via taxation, that I'll actually my resources come in. So I have so many different incentives to keep my own position in politics uh, secure. Okay. So, um, again, sorry to keep uh, <laughs> lobbing these uh, uh, questions at you, but um, when we compare, I mean, and, you know, this is prompted by the comparison that you make to uh, the better performing growth-wise uh, East African economies, uh, couldn't you attribute the whole reason why uh, the latter have done well um, to the economic circle. I mean, okay, so <laughs> let me unpack this a little bit uh, and make it more linear. So isn't natural resource endowment and, you know, formal theories related to natural resource curves, particularly via the macro, as plausible a story as a lead bargain in terms of why, you know, oil exporting countries have done poorer and the countries that you identify as possible t tigers in East Africa have done better? Well, it, um, it, it's all a matter of gradation. You know, if we do it as stark as, as, stark as this, I, I would actually put it simply that it's on average easier for an elite bargain for growth to emerge in the class of countries that are, don't have natural resources. Mm. The incentives for the status quo are, a min are, are less so. In fact, in that sense, it's not very different from, say, also Paul Collier's argument, is that actually, you know, the incentives, the incentives in a natural resource-rich economy are not to go for, uh, for other grow growth economies. And it's the political economy here that actually helps to explain that, not simple the Dutch disease part, because I think with expertise from, from people here and so on, a lot of countries have learned to actually, you know, you mitigate some of the effects of, of, of Dutch disease kind of problems. But it's actually, do you want to mitigate these effects, you know? What is your incentive if you're an oil-rich economy with a small elite living of imports to actually keep your exchange rate, um, make sure that it's not uh, overvalued and so on? So there is the political economy there. So it's harder to do it. So I will be the first to acknowledge that it's harder to actually overcome the political economy constraints in a natural resource-rich economy than in another one. But look, within these groups, we still see differentiation. Yeah. And that's actually the point, you know. Even within the group that don't have natural resources across Africa, you have far better performers and less good performers. Similarly, in the natural resource-rich economies, some are, let me not try to name them, but an absolute mess, and others are actually trying to find a way to accommodate it. But yes, so, so it's again that differentiation suggests mm -hmm. there is agency. Okay. But I, I'm happy to take your point that it's a bit tougher in certain types of countries. I'll be the first one to acknowledge. Okay, so uh, let's maybe delve into these analytical groupings that we have, diversified and undiversified, and then compare, because that's really where I think you're, the forte of your book, where your deep understanding of, of the countries, the issues, um, comes out. So if you could say a little bit about uh, what you can, you know, if you could pick a country that's one of the better performing countries, and say a little bit about um, the specifics of the elite bargain yeah. that took place to facilitate growth. Right. So, um, so, so let me do this all quite, quite quickly. And, yeah. and um, the, you know, I think it's, we, we always end up looking first maybe some, some East Asian places. And so, so even if you look at, say, China, what I find interesting there is that, um, you know, it came on the back of, of a, of a of, of, of country that uh, was actually quite in conflict and quite, quite, quite disrupted, you know, the Cultural Revolution had been the, the death of Mao um, and the Gang of Four, 
And so it became some kind of issue that I remember as a very a much a youngster, people talking about the potential demise of China. And that actually you needed to get somehow, well, you, need, you got somehow a gamble here taking place by well, what we then later on called reformers to actually say, look, let's try to see whether we can get legitimacy within our society again through growth. So it's an important point is this legitimacy seeking behavior. You know? I think if there's one thing to learn from China for African countries, it's that aspect of an underlying commitment and that actually that it brought legitimacy also to, to whoever was, 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 was in charge. And I want to say that's probably the main thing we want to learn from it because otherwise the kind of model of state-led development, you know, it helps if you have 2,000 years of meritocratic bureaucracy and 2,000 years of centralized taxation and 2,000 years of big territory controlled and whatever uh, with clear borders that historically determined in a reasonably sensible way. Well, it probably helps than to actually use the state. So if any country ever could succeed by doing with the state doing quite a lot, mm -hmm. it's probably China. And many of the countries I know in the rest of the book are definitely not like that. So that there is something there. But it then can change us if you then think of um, take a Bangladesh, which I like to talk up as a country that went from this very low position to a much better thing. Of course, it's totally different how we did it. But it did emerge again from, from a difficult situation in the 1970s, uh, the basket case of Henry Kissinger, uh, the kind of you know, conflict, uh, the famine in the early 70s, and, and so on and so on. And economic policies very much trying to stay taken control, nationalization, all the spirit of the time, they're doing this. We seem to have then, in the 1980s, and nobody can really quite well date it. It's always interesting. I was in Bangladesh in June trying to, they all recognized the idea the elite bargain shifted. But nobody can say, this is the moment it happened. But they say, yeah, it's in that period where there was an acceptance that something like RMG, so ready-made garments, the garment sector could emerge out of almost nowhere, no, actually out of nowhere, that social sectors could actually, it didn't really matter that much, the NGOs were largely delivering, and then Bragg became the largest NGO in the world. You know, which country, which government would usually ever allow you to do that, that an NGO becomes more powerful than the state in social sector uh, provision, and so on. So that there was a kind of an elite bargain with more sensible macroeconomic policies supporting it, and so on. So you've got that. So that's a bit like these examples, very different. The state wasn't leading it. In fact, the state was retreating because it realized it was pretty bad at what it had been doing thus far. It did still sell sensible policies, but not trying to take charge of the economy in, in its progress. So, so you get a country like that. Now, going down to Africa, you get, an, of course, contrasting things. So the places where I think I would detect, at least at a particular moment in time, and we can all question what is happening today, I kind of say up to 2019, I would say, for example, Ghana is an interesting case, where the elite bargain probably emerged out of a you know, somewhat imposed new constitution after the rule of Jerry Rawlings, where it overcame certain of the constraints, maybe in politics, which is region ethnic-based politics, and found a way of overcoming that to some extent but actually got itself out of this cycle of fundamental political instability with more rec recognition amongst the elite that political turnover can be handled, it doesn't need to get total chaos, it doesn't need coups, it doesn't need the things. And so you, you create it in a high potential country with, with all kinds of weaknesses in the state and whatever, but at least somehow in politics, a form of stability. You, know, you could all worry about what it is today and we need to always revisit and renew these elite bargains, but definitely for a couple of decades, it created a very different trajectory. I'm even in a similar way thinking of what happened in, in, in Kenya, is where, you know, the after the 2007 violence at the end of the elections, and you know the real problem of ethnic-based politics that people are worried about, you know, you manage to find a way of accommodating different groups a little bit by the decentralization, so that you don't have to control the state centrally. Yes, let me admit to it, to be a bit clientelist and creating the, the opportunities for the people that you're connected to. Mm -hmm. But actually there's a decentralization as well that, that Lu can rule in Lu and have quite a lot of um, uh, rights and opportunities there for, 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 for running and doing policy as well. So decentralization help. Then you could go to Ethiopia, that then we may be getting back to more this kind of, you know, East Asian way of, of emerging from it, which is essentially where a group of people came to power in 91 
it's, Ethiopia is a complicated place, I don't have to tell you that. Um, but, you know, with, with lots of divisions and lots of issues to do with nationalities, ethnicity and, 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 and historical factors that make running the country always very difficult, where in the end, amongst those controlling uh, the, the, the elite, which is, you know, yes, uh, from part of the, one part of the country, but also with others part of that underlying elite bargain, to actually making a deep commitment to saying, look, what we want to do first is getting legitimacy also towards our population through growth and development. And actually a real commitment from a leadership to want to do growth and development, maybe underestimating some of the underlying political bargain, the fragility of it, which is what we see still until, until uh, in recent years, the, the reflection of. But actually you say, look, you're going to have a real deep commitment, which was new for Ethiopia, to actually delivering for people in the countryside, for delivering progress in, 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 in development, maybe with slightly unorthodox or slightly um, interesting policies at time that, you know, you would worry about, are we not sailing close to the wind on the macroeconomy and so on? And there's issues there, but a deep commitment to try to deliver it around the economy. So you get very different places that take within their own political configuration, find a way of actually reflecting the shared commitment to, to growth and development to have it emerge, and then articulate it in within their own context and, and making progress. And these are very different countries, all of them, but they're uh, worth looking at. Thanks, Stefan. You know, um, again, to kick the tire a bit um, on, on uh, the framework and explanation that you've laid out. I mean, one thing you say in your book, of course, and point out is that the development progress, growth outcome in countries like Rwanda, also Ethiopia, have been better than uh, some of the more boisterous democracies, as I like to call them. Uh, could you not attribute this as much to stronger state capacity? in Rwanda, Ethiopia, not unlike some of the East Asian tigers uh, versus uh, these other countries um, where state capacity, you know, really uh, property ownership, et cetera, have been constrained by, you know, institutional frameworks. Yeah. No, look, history matters. So we're not going to question that. Structures matter. And I come back to that. And, you know, and there is some really interesting economic historians work to actually say, you know, Ethiopia has some of the features historically, you know, a centralized state quite early on, um, a building up of a certain bureaucratic capability early on and so on. So the fact that the, that, that uh, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Melissa went for a bit like a developmental state model, you know, he had a little bit more chance that it could work there uh, because there was a bit more history and, and the state wasn't simply built up as a clientelist state and whatever. So, so yeah, so there is a, there's a chance, chance to do it. But I do think that within, um, you know, it comes with its risks as well. And unfortunately, the gamble, you know, I, 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 I think it was, it was a, a gamble, an important gamble to try to do in Ethiopia, given the circumstances, to try to actually get to growth and development. But, you know, the political bargaining proved to be, so to some extent, the undoing. The, 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 the political deal in the country was weaker. And, and the idea that the economic legitimacy can deliver the political uh, deal is then complicated. So, so, you know, you also come with it with its own fragilities with these models. And that's probably what I would, would suggest around the Ethiopia. But within their own context, I can very well understand that they could try to do it. I think it would be pretty hard to do within the underlying historical circumstances of, say, a Ghana and a Kenya to do that kind of simple model. The, the state capability is different, but it's also because the state has been historically differently emerged. So it has to be much more with probably uh, a, a, a much less state-led development, much more decentralized. And I think for them it was finding a political uh, system that somehow managed to handle the kind of functioning of the state and the political bargaining in a way that it created and the opportunity for the economy as well. So, you, so I don't want to say this was the only choices, but I can understand where success in, say, the Ghanas and Kenya is more related to a, a, a state that takes less the lead and it's much more a bit more a private sector model because that would be consistent with the nature of the lead bargain that they would need to have. Where in Ethiopia, at a time, you know, you can understand 
that that attempt was made because at least we had certain circumstances that probably suited this kind of attempt to do it. Now, where it will go further, that's another matter, but that's uh, for, for, for further thinking. Thanks, Stefan. I mean, indeed, I couldn't agree more about the importance of country historic specificity in terms of uh, what is possible in the uh, to um, uh, what's possible by way of uh, advancing policies. So, you know, uh, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on where you see Uganda on this spectrum. Um, I, it strikes me as a country which has enjoyed quite a bit of growth, um, micro stability by and large has been, has been there. But there's been this constant struggle about identifying a model of growth, uh, framework for growth to, to elevate the country to a higher growth trajectory. What is missing or, you know, it's been a successful country of course, but what is it that uh, outside agencies like us could help uh, advance? Well, that's a, yeah, and that's a, that's an interesting. It's it's maybe even it's it's in some sense a, a bit of a of, of, of a tricky question because, you know, it's one is what is possible, and then we come to it. Well, what do outsiders do? Okay, so so the interesting thing about about uh, Uganda, and it's 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 it was interesting when I was trying to write on Uganda, and I spent considerable time over the years there. I was actually kind of weighing, you know, what do I now call it? Because if we go back to the 1990s, of course, it was the darling of all of us in terms of saying what they were doing. And, and there was something remarkable that peace and stability, you know, this first condition of a kind of a development bargain, a, st a stability of a of development bargain, a basic peace and stability was restored. And an economic model was emerging of some, of some you know, there was serious growth and so on, and, um, and sensible things in that kind of idea that we were describing earlier, you know, making sure there's broad, broad opportunities that are possible and, and so on. Now, um, and what you really would admire that a lot of the policies that were set at the time by the president, um, and of course he was very influential in that and by his team, or that he was willing to allow to happen, you know, and he was definitely the architect of the elite bargain at the time, were very long term. Now maybe the small detail that I probably, maybe we didn't quite realize is that one reason why it may have been long term is that he had eyes on very long-term rent generation of the state. Now, I'm not saying, you know, of course, in the politics, I'm not, in a personal sense, I, I, I wish these countries would be more, more open and, and, and more, more contested. But, you know, you've got long-term policy framework, partly maybe linked, and if I'm for a moment cynical, because the president had eyes to be there for, for forever, uh, not to, to, to have a transition of, uh, of power. But, of course, at some point, that underlying political system, you know, it's relatively open, but it's not totally open, is expensive. And actually, it gets us to the situation also where, where it's very hard to actually overcome the status quo. So we could do very sensible macroeconomic policies that arguably you should approve of as the IMF, but actually probably far less attempt to actually saying, let's now turn this into a growth trajectory, maybe a little bit of you know, sailing a little bit closer to the wind with the macro, but actually trying to see can't we do it because you have all these ingredients of stability and all the things and the potential. So I just worry that it's within the political incentives of valuing the stability more than the growth and where we could be in 20 or 30 years makes us very risk averse in the underlying economic policy making. And, um, and i be honest, I'm speculating here because it's very hard to get into the mind to it, but you feel like coming into the last 20 years, Uganda feels a bit like a missed opportunity in growth. And that clearly would suggest that, that, that the underlying, that either the political bargaining is such that it would be very hard to have done anything else. I think it's a bit of the agency, the choices made that they value the status quo and the stability within the political system a little bit more than actually the developmental growth orientation and the future of, of the growth in the country. Thanks, Stefan. Um, the final part of your book, of course, is talking a little bit more to uh, you know, the role of development cooperation uh, and you know, what donors, international financial institutions, um, could do differently, right? Um, can you say a little bit about, you know, um, 
what institutions like the IMF, uh, perhaps the World Bank, also uh, could be doing better? Yeah. So, so the first thing I would say is that some of the things I, I will say is that individuals within these organizations totally buy into it and probably try to put it into practice. So, so my appeal is more to be willing to recognize and find both an internal and maybe harder sometimes external language to recognize this a bit better. So it's being a little bit more smarter explicitly rather than smart operators implicitly with it. So that's, that's what kind of thing I really think. So, so you, you have to be willing to recognize, I think, better why the actual policies that are taken, why they are what they are, okay? So, you know, you, you, you need to be clear about it. It's not about, um, so you have to recognize that elite interests matter. And I think in practice, you know that in negotiations and so on, you do that. But actually, we, we don't have a, an instrument set in our economics, in our economic advice, that actually knows how to integrate that kind of politics, po po politics Properly. So it's basically the point is that I can talk to the central bank governor, governor and they may all agree uh, with these are the things we need to do and we agree that this is the list of things to do. I'm sure that governor, and unless she or he is not terribly smart, would know exactly what the constraints would be for each of them both politically and what to deliver mm -hmm. and what not to deliver. I think in an organization like this, we need to just be willing to, first of all, recognize these political constraints, okay? So, because delivery will be dependent on it. And what I always find really problematic is say, oh, there's a 10 things that need to be done. And then say, oh, four have been done and it's fine. And no, that actually sometimes can make it worse. You know, you, there's a reason why there are 10 that you think need to happen, because if you do certain four, it shifts relative incentives and it actually make, make it even worse. And it's basically, we need to guard ourselves against making it worse, that we actually embed the elite bargain that exists further by the way we act. Um, I will, uh, I'm thinking of you know, countries that say have repeated IMF programs that generally fail, and um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you know, Pakistan has not been terribly successful in completing programs, and we'll go keep on going back. You know, actually, you have to ask yourself, what are we actually doing? Are we actually allowing the continuation of a bad elite bargain or not. Now, I'm, I'm not going to call it out like that necessarily, but it's a question to ask, okay? So, because your governor may well be well-intentioned, they operate within constraints, but actually we have another game. So we are outsiders, we can't be neutral because any action we take, whether as the World Bank as the IMF, we are actually participants. We, um, we shift somehow the incentives either to strengthen what exists or to change or strengthen the incentives of those who want change. And so we should be willing to recognize that. And I know it's hard publicly to do that, but to do things. Now, the problem arises, I think, with our advice. Even though we may all recognize this, our advice, as good economists, we train to offer the first best. Now, the first best, knowing that it not will be implemented, is not the same as the second best. The first you have to be willing to think about, at the minimum, what is the second best here, between, given the constraints we can't overcome here. Mm -hmm. And that actually is different advice than that list of the first best advice. We don't do that. We think we can't do it, so we give forever the same first best advice. No, you need to be willing to do this. Now, but then you want to be more ambitious, because then the second best is very disappointing. You say, do we really want to take the political constraints as given? So therefore, in a certain country, we will keep on having 12 exchange rates, because that's the only way the, 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 the round tripping can be financed. Um, and also the politics can be financed, because it creates the incentives for round tripping and people making advantage of different exchange rates. No, that's not actually right. And then we'll have to, because that's not the second best that we can achieve, because we are affecting the elite bargain by our actions. So we actually need to be willing to make these political constraints and the implementation constraints endogenous and ask ourselves, what is the set of advice we give that gets us the best possible outcome, given the political constraints, but recognizing that our actions probably affect these political constraints as well. Actually, there's a paper by Asimo Green Robinson in the Journal of Economic Perspective in 2013, I yeah. think, that exactly describes it like that. And that's, I think we don't do that. And it seems self-evident 
that we are working in a political environment, that we influence that political environment by our actions, so that our, that our advice, which will be second best properly, would need to take into account some of these things because we want to nudge these countries forward. You know, we want to get them to grow and to have sensible, sensible uh, economic policies that, that 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 pushes us forward. Thank you so much, Stefan. That's very, very uh, helpful, and indeed, I agree with you that uh, too often we 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 are stuck in the first best policy world and. Um, and uh, need to be thinking about broader set of policy options. You know, uh, we have a question from uh, one of our, um, or, you know, an audience member uh, and, and policymaker. I shall not name who it is, but uh, who asks a very pithy question: uh, Are you basically saying in your book that development is mo uh, more a matter for politicians than economists? So, so no, it isn't. And first of all, is that. Uh, politics is economics. Politics in most countries we're dealing with, not least in Africa, but also in, in, in my own country, it is in the end about you know, thinking through uh, who has access to resources and how do we set incentives for certain groups and for other groups to, to accumulate resources. You know, we should just recognize that politics is economics. And I'm not trying to hear being becoming a kind of semi-Marxist, but it's basically we just should recognize that. You know, they, that's what that, that, that what a lot of the lot of politics is about that, mm -hmm. about controlling mm -hmm. resources and so on. Therefore, I think we should just be smarter. I mean, economists are the discipline that thinks through trade-offs and incentives. Now, fundamentally, that's our role to either at the least be extremely clear what these trade-offs are. And that's coming back to the second best. You know, why is it the second best, not the first? But then be very clear about what, what, it, what it is. Be articulating the, the, the trade-offs. And indeed, thinking through smartly how to set the incentives. And as incentives, again, any economic policy that, whether it's Minister of Finance or, or, or um, a governor or a central bank puts forward, shifts incentives. And, you know, yeah, and it's, of course, Economists, despite our <laughs> appearance at times, we, we are not the same as the ones that are in power. Those in power is always the coalition between all the groups in, in your society that's powerful. But we have such a central role. And the political bargaining happens. And it's, I think, our role also as economic advice to be smarter about to bring setting these incentives for the political bargaining better, or at least elucidating, clarifying, and really pointing to the trade-offs in the choices they make. So yeah, so it's politics matters, but we have such a key role in it. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, very reassuring as an economist. Uh, we have about a minute left, and uh, one last question. You know, I, I, again, the, the book is imbued with a lot of optimism, a lot of optimism about the future, uh, and for Africa, I sense it. Maybe I'm just, you know, uh, channeling my own optimism. But if you could say a little bit about, you know, the conjuncture and what you think the possibilities are, or do you think uh, those are limited? Yeah. Look, the, the, the circumstances are much more constrained. And, and, and I'm, I'm one of these people that probably regrets that we didn't take as many of the opportunities when we were in the phase of Africa rising and when the super cycle of the commodities. And realistic that during, conf during the kind of downturn and the difficult things, it's, it's so much uh, harder to actually actually do it. But I'm reassured that the few countries that were successful, including in, in the Asian examples and including also in the African context, they did it usually when things are bad. They, they laid the foundation of that next phase while things were actually pretty bad. The action room is limited, but actually the behaviors you can actually change in this kind of moment. So this is why it is a pivotal moment, even though it's not entirely clear what these opportunities will be. And it may well be tougher, and maybe it will mean the opportunity set is a half a percent or a percentage lower in growth than we could have achieved maybe in the earlier phase of this century. But it's still worth doing, because the counterfactual is pretty grim. Stefan. 
Thank you so, so much for uh, coming. Uh, again, uh, we've been discussing uh, gambling on development, why some countries win and others lose. Uh, fantastic uh, book on, uh, on recent development trajectories in Africa and elsewhere and uh, uh, what we can learn from them. Again, thank you so much for honoring our invitation and coming here, Stefan. Well, thank you so much for hosting me. Absolutely. Thank you.